Hello everybody and welcome back to the sofa. Y'all, we are jumping right into this video today. Hold on to your sofa seatbelts, everybody. Okay, so the probable cause was released earlier today in the Brian Koberger case, the Idaho case that we've all been following. Thank you, first of all, to everybody who was like sending me emails and reaching out to me in the comments, all that kind of stuff, saying, Paul, oh, you, you gotta read it. So I was at work today all day long. I had to work a very long day. I took a quick lunch and read through it and my mouth was on the ground. I think I posted to the community page and to the Patreon members. <clears throat> we talked about it a little bit over there when I could, but I am home from work now. It's a little bit late at night. And what we're going to do for this video is I'm going to read through this. Now, what I want to do is basically just read through the affidavit because I was literally trying to pick out parts I wanted to talk about and there's so many different things. So what I'll do is I'll read some, I'll make some commentary along the way. If you've read it, then you know some key points we're going to be talking about, right? So that being said, if you just want to read through the affidavit, you don't want to hear me interjecting any of that. I'm going to link down below to Brian Enton's, uh, Twitter, you can go there, read it there. I'll do another link to an article and you can read through the whole thing. You don't have to hear all my little stuff in there with it. If you want to hear my opinions on it, then just hang on as we continue through. And then of course, at the very end of the video, I'll do some overall thoughts on it. As I always like to say, I am not any kind of a professional lawyer, therapist, cop, anything like that. I'm just a guy with a sofa and some opinions on true crime. So let's go ahead and jump on in. Now I'm going to post the things up here, like a little page of it or whatever. So if you want to pause and read, depending on what device you're looking at, um, you can can do that as well. So here we go. <clears throat> now this is the first page, Exhibit A, Statement of Brett Payne. Now we're going to just go ahead and jump to the second paragraph on here because this just talks about some key dates that we just need to establish so we're all on the same page. So on November 13th, 2022, at approximately 4 p.m., Moscow Police Department, Sergeant Blaker and I responded to 1122 King Road, Moscow, Idaho, hereafter the King Road residence to assist with scene security and processing of a crime scene associated with four homicides. Upon our arrival, the state police, <clears throat> pardon me, the Idaho State Police forensic team was on scene and was preparing to begin processing the scene. MPD officer, Officer Smith, was one of the initial responding officers to the incident, advised he would walk through the scene. Officer Smith and I entered the King Road residence through the bottom floor door on the north side of the building. Officer Smith and I then walked upstairs to the second floor. Officer Smith directed me down the hallway to the west bedroom on the second floor, which I later learned through Zana's driver's license and other personal belongings found in the room that that room was Zana's, was Zana uh, Kronodal's, here and after Kronodal room. Just before, <clears throat> pardon me, just before this room, there was a bathroom door on the south wall of the hallway. As I approached the room, I could see a body later identified as Kronodal's laying on the floor. Kronodal was deceased with wounds which appeared to have been caused by an edged weapon. Also in the room was a, was a male later identified as Ethan Chapin here, <clears throat> pardon me, hereafter Chapin. Chapin was also deceased with wounds later determined. Autopsy report provided by Spokane, and I'm just going to flip the page here. Uh, County Medical Examiner, it's been redacted, dated December 15th, 2022, to be caused by sharp force injuries. It's so creepy and scary and just real listening to them describe walking through this house and finding these poor young people. Let's continue. I then followed Officer Smith upstairs to the third floor of the residence. The third floor consisted of two bedrooms and one bathroom. The bedroom on the west side of the floor was later determined to be Kaylee Goncalves and hereafter Goncalves' room. Sorry, the, the type on this is very small on my computer and I should be wearing glasses, so let me scoot it closer. Um, I later learned from review of Officer Noon's body camera that there was a dog in the room when Moscow police officers initially responded. The dog did belong to Kaylee and her ex-boyfriend Jack. Uh, I found out from my interview with Jack on November 13th, 2022 that he and Kaylee shared the dog. Uh, Officer Smith then pointed out a small bathroom on the east side to the third floor. This bathroom shared a wall with Madison Mogan's hereafter Mogan's bedroom, which was situated on the southeast corner of the third floor. As I entered this bedroom, I could see two females in the single bed in the room. Both Goncalves, I'm sorry, both 
Goncalves and Mogan were deceased with visible stab wounds. Now, I apologize if I'm messing the last names up. Like I said, the type is small. I'm so used to calling them by their first name, so it, doing just the last name kind of it throws me off a little bit. So I apologize if I'm messing these up here. I also, <clears throat> pardon me, I also later noticed what appeared to be a tan leather knife sheath laying on the bed next to Mogan's right side when viewed from the door. The sheath was later processed and had Kabar and USMC and the United States Marine Corps Eagle Globe and Anchor Insignia stamped on the outside of it. The Idaho State Lab later located a single source of male DNA suspect profile left on the button snap of the knife sheath. Pause for a second. This is so major. Now, y'all, it's going to be a whole other video that I do, and maybe even a live chat on the other channel, that we talk about this whole thing of this dude who's been posting in the Facebook groups that was saying about this whole sheath, sheath thing, and it's, you know, allegedly was Brian under a different profile, whatever. I just want to acknowledge that because so many of you were talking to me about this today, like email me and stuff like that. And I just haven't looked into it fully, but it's eerie if that does turn out to be that that's the case. So here's the thing with this part right here. First of all, look at all along that this was going. First, can we just give a shout out to the police officers for the job that they did and like, you know, just being tight lipped about this and not letting Brian know that they were onto him? Because as we're going to see, they instantly basically knew it was him, right? I mean, it did not take much. The guy was messy. I really thought we were dealing with somebody who wanted to prove how they could get away with the perfect crime and this, that, and the other. He's a criminology student, this, that, and the other. Here he's left his, his fingerprint DNA with the knife sheath from, you know, the weapon. Blows my mind, but again, thank the Lord he was this messy. It probably saved many other lives. Okay, let's continue. Now, as part of the investigation, numerous interviews were conducted by Moscow Police Department officers, Idaho State Police detectives, and FBI agents. Two of the interviews included BF and DM. Both BF and DM were inside the King Road residence at the time of the homicides and were roommates to the victims. BF's, <clears throat> pardon me, BF's bedroom was located on the east side of the first floor of the King Road residence. Now, as we've come to know that these are two of the, the roommates, the survivors, you know, we'll call them that they're using the initials here uh, but these are the survivors there's going to be some very interesting stuff that comes out about them so let's get into it Based on numerous interviews conducted by MPD officers, ISP detectives, and FBI agents, as well as my review of evidence, I have learned the following. On the evening of November 12th, 2022, so this is the night before, Chapin and Cronuto were seen by BF at the Sigma Chi House on the University of Idaho campus at 733 Nez Perce Drive from approximately 9 p.m. on November 12th to 1.45 a.m. on November 13th. BF also estimated that at approximately 1.45 a.m., Chapman and Cronodal returned to the King Road residence. BF also stated that Chapman did not live in the King Road residence, but was a guest of Cronodal's. Okay, this, we we know this at this point, right? <clears throat> Goncalves and Mogan were at a local bar, the Corner Pub, at 202 North Main Street in Moscow. Goncalves and Mogan can be seen on the video footage provided by the Corner Club between 10 p.m. on November 12th and 1.30 a.m. on November 13th. This is the and now the infamous footage we've all seen. At approximately 1.30 a.m., Goncalves and Mogan can be seen on the video at the local food vendor called The Grub Truck at 318 South Main Street in downtown Moscow. The Grub Truck live streams video from their food truck on the streaming platform Twitch, which is available for public viewing on their website. This video was captured by law enforcement. A private party redacted reported that he provided a ride to Goncalves. I gone I keep I apologize I just want to call her Kaylee I keep messing her last name up I apologize everybody uh and Mogan at one approximately 1:56 a.m. from downtown Moscow in front of Grub Truck to the King Road residence 
Diem and BF both made statements during interviews that indicated the occupants of the King Road residence were home by 2 a.m. and asleep, or at least in their rooms by approximately 4 a.m. This is with the exception of Cronodal, who received a DoorDash order at the residence at approximately 4 a.m. Law enforcement identified the DoorDash delivery driver who reported this information. Diem stated she originally went to sleep in her bedroom on the southeast side of the second floor. Diem stated that she was awoken at approximately 4 a.m. by what she stated sound like Kaylee playing with her dog in one of the upstairs bedrooms, which were located on the third floor. Now, y'all, this is where this gets bone chilling. A short time later, Diem said she heard what she thought was Kaylee say something to the effect of, there's someone here. A review of records obtained from a forensic download of Cronodal's phone showed this could also have been Cronodal as her cellular phone indicated she was likely awake and using the TikTok app at approximately 4.12 a.m. So pause real quick, the roommate's waking up, she hears the stuff of playing with the dog now you know, this is just what freaks me out so bad is to sit here and listen and be like, all of this was going on. She had no clue at this time what was taking place. And then this whole thing of there's someone here. I mean, my gosh, can you imagine? Like the, hearing this unfold, it just, I mean, these poor, these poor kids. DM stated she looked out of her bedroom but did not see anything when she heard the comment about someone being in the house. DM stated she opened her door a second time when she heard what she thought was crying coming from Cronoodle's room. DM then said she heard a male voice say something to the effect of, It's okay, I'm going to help you. I mean, my gosh, right? So the roommate opens the door once, doesn't hear anything. So this is enough to make her open the door and be like, what's up? You know, like, I, what's going on? And then she opens it a second time with the crying and this kind of stuff. So to me, this is like something's not right, something's going on. And I'm going to return to this thought in just a minute when we finish with this right here. And just again, pay attention to the time. So at approximately 4.17 a.m., a security camera located at 1112 King Road, a residence immediately to the northwest of 1122 King Road, picked up distorted audio of what sounded like voices or a whimper, followed by a loud thud. A dog can also be heard barking numerous times starting at 4.17 a.m. Again, the security cameras in less, is less than 50 feet from the west wall of Cronodal's bedroom. DM stated she opened her door for the third time after she heard the crying and saw a figure clad in black clothing and a mask that covered the person's mouth and nose walking towards her. DM described the figure as 5'10 or taller, male, not very muscular, but athletically built with bushy eyebrows. The male walked past DM as she stood in a frozen shock phase. The male walked towards the back sliding glass door. DM locked herself in her room after seeing the male. DM did not state that she recognized the male. This leads investigators to believe that the murderer left the scene. Pause. So the roommate opens the door three times. Now this has been, number one, I have tons of questions about this, obviously. Not just with her, but with, you know, Brian. Allegedly Brian, right? Um... Okay, so all this interaction is going on to where something's not right, something's going on, so on and so forth. Now, you know, this house has been portrayed as this party house and this and that and blah, 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 blah. You know, so I think it's interesting that this disturbance was enough to make the roommate be like, what, you know, what's going on? Let me poke my head out, not once, but twice, but thrice. Then looking death in the face right now as she's describing him this this figure at this point obviously we know you know that again that it's you know the the suspect sounds just like him you know not muscular but athletically built the bushy eyebrows so on and so forth i mean she saw this dude right some questions before we even get into like when 911 was called and what happened after this what does this mean? Why didn't Brian do something to her? 
if he walked past her and she's in a frozen, shocked, you know, whatever, what does this say? Why didn't he take this witness out? What does this say about the other incidents that took place? Because I've often been like, you know, was he after the girls on the third floor? You know, and then the other two were just collateral damage. Well, if that's the case, why didn't anything happen here? Here's someone who saw him, right? You know, was he just was he himself flustered things didn't go the way he planned them to so he left i have so many questions but again i'm not questioning that at least thank god the two other people survived right they are so lucky i mean it just it baffles me now also what this says to me is like hearing all the stuff the crying the whimpering the thud you know how when your like little spidey senses just tell you that something's something ain't right right and it's like uh, you know even if this is a party house you know i just feel like with her there's a, some sense of like something's not right you know let me look out here and then clearly it wasn't so let's keep reading here and so the combination of DM statements to law enforcement, reviews of forensic downloads of records from BF and DM's phones, and video of a suspect video of a suspect video as described below leads investigators to believe the homicides occurred between 4 and 4.25 a.m. During the processing of the crime scene, investigators found a latent shoe print. This was located during the second processing of the crime scene by the ISP forensic team by first using a, presumpt a presumptive blood test and then amino black, a protein stain that detects the presence of cellular material. The detected shoe print showed a diamond-shaped pattern, similar to the pattern of a van's type shoe sole just outside the door of dm's bedroom located on the second floor this is consistent with dm's statement regarding the suspect's path of travel so again here's the stuff walt right past opening the door frozen the whole nine yards maybe he didn't see i mean i don't know but it just seems super weird to me right so we're gonna get into at the end of the video all of the sloppiness on his part and again i'm not complaining that he was sloppy but it i did not expect this right at all let's continue as part of the investigation an extensive search commonly referred to in law enforcement as a video canvas was conducted in the area of the king road residence this video canvas canvas was to obtain any footage from the early morning hours of november 13th 2022 in the area of the King Road residence and surrounding neighborhoods in an effort to locate the suspect or suspect vehicles vehicles traveling to or leaving the King Road residence. This video canvas resulted in the collection of numerous surveillance videos in the area from both residential and business addresses. I reviewed numerous videos that were collected and have had conversations with other MPD officers, ISP detectives, and FBI agents that are similarly reviewing uh, footage that was obtained. A review of the camera footage indicated that a white sedan hereafter suspect vehicle one was observed traveling westbound in the 700 block of indian hills drive in moscow at approximately 3:26 a.m and westbound on steiner avenue at idaho state idaho highway 95 in moscow at approximately 3:28 a.m on this video it appeared suspect vehicle one was not displaying a front license plate a review of footage from the multiple videos obtained from the king road neighborhood showed multiple sightings of suspect vehicle one starting at 3:29 a.m and ending at 4.20 a.m. These sightings show suspect vehicle one make an initial three passes by the 1122 King Road residence and then leave via Wallenta Drive. Based off my experience as a patrol officer, this is a residential neighborhood with very limited number of vehicles that travel in the area during the early morning hours. Or upon review of the video, there are only a few cars that enter and exit this area during this time frame. 
So just pause real quick. I mean, again, it's like, how many times is he on camera? At this point, the more that we get into this, it's almost like, did he want to get caught? You know what I mean? Let's continue. Suspect vehicle one could be seen entering the area a fourth time, approximately around 4.04 a.m. It could be seen driving eastbound on King Road, stopping and turning around in front of 500 Queen Road, number 52, and then driving back westbound on King Road. When when suspect vehicle one is in front of the King Road residence, it appeared to unsuccessfully attempt to park or turn around in the road. The vehicle continued to the intersection of Queen Road and King Road, where it can be seen completing a three-point turn and then driving eastbound again down Queen Road. Again, I mean, it's almost like he found every video camera and did donuts in front of it, right? Again, thank God he did. Suspect Vehicle 1 is next seen departing the area of King Road residence at approximately 4.20 a.m. at a high rate of speed. Suspect Vehicle 1 is next observed traveling southbound on Walenta Drive. Based on my knowledge of the area and review of camera footage in the neighborhood, that does not show Suspect Vehicle 1 during that time frame. I believe that Suspect Vehicle 1 likely exited the neighborhood at Palouse River Drive and Con Con Conestoga Drive. Uh, let's see. Palooza River Drive is at the southern edge of Moscow and proceeds into Whitman County, Washington. There you go. Eventually, the road leads to Pullman, Washington. Again, there you go. Pullman, Washington is approximately 10 miles from Moscow out of Idaho. Both Pullman and Moscow are small college towns and people commonly travel back and forth between them. And as we've learned here, especially those of us that aren't from here, we're learning more than we ever thought we would know about this area. You know, this is one of the things of like, look, when it started coming out, that we, you know, it's Brian and this guy, you know, Pullman's right down the road, it's 10 miles away, and now we see, you know, yes. Again, all of this video footage, and again, kudos to the police for keeping this to their chest, tight-lipped, to not, you know, tip him off that they were on to him because almost instantly all this video evidence surfaced. Yes, you know, so by the time they came out about the car thing, it was interesting they, you know, had known about this, right? Uh, so I just, I think they really did a good job with this. Uh, let's continue. So law enforcement officers provided video footage of suspect one to forensic examiners with the FBI that regularly utilizes utilize surveillance footage to identify the year, make, and model of unknown vehicle that is observed by one or more cameras during the commission of a criminal offense. The forensic examiner has approximately 35 years experience. Uh, it just goes into his training and whatnot. Let's skip down to paragraph three. After reviewing the numerous observations of suspect vehicle one, the forensic examiner initially believed that the vehicle was a 2011 or 2013 Hyundai Elantra, but upon further review, it, he indicated it could also be a 2011 to 2016 Hyundai Elantra. As a result, as a result, investigators have been reviewing information on persons in possession of a vehicle that is a 2011 to 2016 white Hyundai Elantra. Investigators were given access to video footage on the Washington State University campus located in Pullman, Washington. A review of that video indicated that at approximately 2.44 a.m. on November 13th, a white sedan, which was consistent with the description of the white Elantra, known as suspect vehicle number one, was observed on WSU surveillance cameras, traveling north on Southeast Nevada Street at Northeast Stadium Way. At approximately 2.53 a.m., a white sedan, which is consistent with the description of the Elantra, known as Suspect Vehicle 1, it was observed driving, traveling southeast on Nevada Street in Pullman, Washington, towards State Road 270. State Road 270 connects Pullman to Moscow. Now, before we flip to the page, you see how they're lining all this up. I mean, literally, y'all. Like I said, it's it's shocking to me, and this is just part of it. For someone who studies this, again, psychologically, I was expecting someone who was trying to get away with something, and this just it seems so messy to me. It seems, and I don't want to even say like sudden, because as we'll learn, he's been casing this house for a while, right? But it makes me just wonder what took place this night. What made it? 
what tipped him off or what put him over the edge because I just feel like for some of the things we're about to learn that he was trying to cover tracks did the man not think about video cameras I mean and like did the to and the fro and all this type stuff I just it baffles me beyond belief how sloppy he was because I it was not expected let's go ahead to the next page this camera footage from Pullman, Washington was provided to the same FBI forensic examiner. Uh, they identified the vehicle observed in Pullman, Washington as being a 2014 to 2016 Hyundai Elantra. So here, you know, they've narrowed in the car. Yes, this is it. At approximately 5.25 a.m., a white sedan, which was consistent with the description of suspect vehicle one, was observed on five cameras in Pullman, Washington and on WSU campus cameras. The first camera that recorded the white sedan was located at 1300 Johnson Road in Pullman. The white sedan was observed traveling northbound on Johnson Road. Johnson Road leads directly to the West Palouse River Drive in Moscow, which intersects with Kun Kunestoga Drive. The white sedan was then observed turning north on Bishop Boulevard and northwest on State Road 270. And at approximately 5.27 a.m., the Elantra was observed on cameras traveling northbound on Stadium Way at Nevada Street, Stadium Way at Grimes Way, Stadium Drive at Wilson Road, and Stadium way at Cougar Way. And then it shows this little map here. It's very small here. Uh, depictions showing the white Elantra's path of travel. It's not to scale, it says. Now, on November 25th, 2022, MPD asked area law enforcement agencies to be on the lookout for the white Hyundai Elantras in the area. So this is written November 25th now. Okay, so this is like, what, about a week later? Uh, on November 29th at approximately 12.28 a.m., WSU, Washington State University, police officer Daniel Tiango queried white Elantras registered at WSU. As a result of that query, he located a 2015 white Elantra with a Pennsylvania license plate. This vehicle was registered to Brian Koberger, hereafter Koberger, residing at 1630 Northeast Valley Road, apartment 201 Pullman, Washington. 1630 Northeast Valley Road is approximately three quarters of a mile from the intersection of Stadium Way and Cougar Way. Last camera locations that picked up the white Elantra. So y'all, by November 25th, so November 25th, the thing went out November 29th. So about two weeks after, right? There's start, bam, here we go. You know, they've got the car, they've got the name, you know, everything is starting to come together. And again, this is what I'm talking about where I expected a, a higher level of organization with this from the perpetrator. And so as we're seeing this, where I'm just like, you know, my gosh, you know, it's just he led little breadcrumbs right to him. Thank the Lord. Let's continue. The same day at approximately 12.58 a.m., WSU officer Curtis Whitman was looking for white Hyundai Elantras and located a 2015 Elantra at the 1630 Northeast Valley Road in Pullman in the parking lot. Uh, it's an apartment complex that houses WSU students. Officer Whitman also ran the car and it returned to Coburger with a Washington tag. I reviewed Coburg's Washington State driver's license information and photograph. This license indicates that Coburger is a white male with a height of 6 feet and weighs 185. Additionally, the photograph of Coburger shown, shows that he has bushy eyebrows. Remember the description that the girl gave. Coburger's physical description is consistent with the description of the male DM saw inside the King Road residence on November 13th. So, I mean, there you go. Further investigation, including a review of Lada County Sheriff's Depe Deputy CPL Duke's body cam and reports, showed that on August 21st, 2022, Koberger was detained as part of a traffic stop that occurred in Moscow, Idaho by CPL Duke. At that time, Koberger, who was the sole occupant, was driving a, guess what, 2015 Hyundai Elantra with Pennsylvania plate and gives the plates, which was set to expire on November 30th, 2022. So remember how they're like, oh, you know, he changed the thing and all this kind of stuff. You know, I mean, this was going to happen anyways, right? So, I mean, I do think the timing is interesting. And I would like to kind of look into that further as we learn more about this case. Let's continue. During the stop, which was, <clears throat> pardon me, during the stop, which was recorded via a law enforcement body camera, Koberger provided his phone number. It, 
redact some of it. Hereafter, the 8458 phone as a cellular telephone number. Investigators conducted electronic database queries and learned that the 848 phone is a number issued by AT&T. Now, one thing we're also going to see here is this boy gets pulled over all the time, okay? This is another thing that I'm just like, dude, like, I mean, for someone that was like, you know, seemingly, allegedly planning something like this up, I would be 10 and 2 wherever I went driving, right? I mean, it's just, it, again, it's psychologically interesting to me because I'm like, what does this mean? What does it say? You know, that he just, he constantly gets pulled over, right? Anyway, let's just keep going. Um, let's see. On October 14th, 2022, so remember, the thing we just talked about was in August. Now we're at October 14th, 2022. Koberg was detained as a part of a traffic stop by a WSU police officer. Upon review of that body cam and report of the stop, Koberg was the sole occupant. He was driving the Elantra, Pennsylvania license plate. November 18th, 22, according to W or to Washington State Licensing, he Koberger registered the 2015 white Elantra with Washington and later received Washington plate. It gives that. Prior to this time, the 2015 Elantra was registered in Pennsylvania, which does not require a front license plate to be displayed. This was learned through communications with the Pennsylvania officer who is currently certified in the state of Pennsylvania. Based on my own experience and communication with Washington law enforcement, I know that Idaho and Washington require front and back license plates to be displayed. Investigators believe that Koberger is still driving the 2015 white Elantra because his vehicle was captured on December 13th, 2022 by a license plate reader in Loma, Colorado. Uh, Koberger's Elantra was then queried on December 15th by law enforcement in Hancock, Indiana. We've seen some of this footage at this point, right? Uh, and on December 16th, 2022, at approximately 2.26 p.m., surveillance video showed Koberger's Elantra in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania. The sole occupant of the vehicle was a white male whose description was consistent with Koberger. Koberger has family in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania. Learned through a TLO search and low and locate tool database query. Based on the information provided on the WSU website, Koberger is currently a PhD student in criminology at WSU. Pursuant to records provided by a member of the interview panel for Pullman Police Department, we learned that Koberger's past education included undergraduate degrees in psychology and cloud-based forensics. These records also show Koberger wrote an essay when he applied for an internship with Pullman Police Department in the fall of 2022. Again, very interesting that we see you know he's tried to apply to the police department all this you know hand in this world you know the criminology the psychology i want to be a police officer i was a security thing at the school all this type of stuff you know again very interesting uh Co let's see koberger wrote in his essay that he had interest in assisting rural law enforcement agencies with how to better collect and analyze technological data and public safety operations Koberger has also posted a Reddit survey, which can be found by an open source internet search. The survey asked for participants to provide information to understand how emotions and psychological traits influence decision making when committing a crime. Now, we've gone over this in another one of my videos and many other channels have as well. Uh, and of course, obviously, the survey is interesting. I have seen in comments and like other places where people are talking about, again, this is all just alleged and other people speaking that might be of this world or maybe a professor that say, you know what, this is kind of a run-of-the-mill survey, nothing to see here, folks, type thing. Again, just take that for what it is. Um, I, regardless, not being of that world, find the survey questions extremely interesting. And even if they were kind of run-of-the-mill stuff, like, oh, this doesn't mean, you know, a specific thing, I do find it interesting because I think regardless of whatever it is he is using those answers and that information in a very specific way that we've seen play out in this unfortunate way let's continue as part of the this investigation law enforcement obtained search warrants to determine cellular devices that utilize cell towers in close proximity to the king road residence on and November 13th, 2022 between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. after determining that Koberger was associated to both the 2015 white Elantra 
and the 8458 phone, investigators reviewed these search warrant returns. A query of the 8458 phone and these returns did not show the 8458 phone utilizing cell tower resources in close proximity to the King Road residence between 3 and 5 a.m. Now this part gets very interesting here. Based on my training experience and conversation with law enforcement officers that specialize in the utilization of cellular telephone records as part of investigation, individuals can either leave their cell, phone, cell phones at a different location before committing a crime or turn their cell phones off prior to going to a location to commit a crime. This is done by subjects in an effort to avoid alerting law enforcement that a cell device associated with them was in particular was in a particular area where they in tend to commit a crime prior to the date of the crime. Depending on the circumstances, this could be done a few days before or for several months prior to the commission of a crime. During these types of surveillance, it is possible that an individual would not leave their cell phone at a separate location or turn it off since they do not plan to commit the offense on that particular day. Now, this is where those will get interesting here. So on December 23rd, 2020. I applied for and granted a search warrant for historical phone records between the 12th at 12 a.m. and the 14th, this is of November, at 12 a.m. for the 8458 uh, telephone. On December 23rd, pursuant to that search warrant, he got the information. These records indicated that the 8458 phone is subscribed to Brian Koberger at an address in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania, uh, and the account has since... And the account has been open since June 23rd, 2022. These records also include historical cell site location information for the 8458 phone. After receiving this information, I consulted with the FBI agent that is certified as a member of the cell analysis survey team. Members of CAST are certified with the FBI to provide expert testimony in the field of historical CLS CSLI and are required to pass extensive training that includes both written and practical exams prior to be certified with CAST as well as the completion of yearly certification requirements. It just goes on a little bit further. Let's jump to the next paragraph. On November 13th at approximately 2.42 a.m., so remember this timeline here, the 8458 phone was utilizing cell resources that provided coverage to 1630 Northeast Valley Road, apartment G201, Pullman, Washington. So hit Brian's phone, is using the, he's doing phone stuff, it's there, it's going, at two, you know, this quarter till three in the morning, near his place. Here after the Coburg residence, at approximately 2.47 a.m., the phone utilized cellular resources that provide coverage southeast of the Coburger residence, consistent with the 8458 phone leaving the residence and traveling south through Pullman, Washington. This is consistent with the movement of the white Elantra. So look at how they're able to just literally, it's like putting a piece of paper down and tracing. I mean, it's crazy to me. Okay, and I mean, it's amazing also, right? Uh, but it's just, it, it boggles my mind. Okay, so at approximately 2.47, the phone stops reporting to the network, which is consistent with either the phone being in an area without cell coverage, the connection to the network is disabled, such as putting the phone in airplane mode, or that the phone is turned off. Now, even if we gave this person the benefit of the doubt, let's keep reading. The 8458 phone does not report to the network again until 4.48 a.m., at which time it utilized cell resources that provide coverage to ID State Highway 95 south of Moscow, Idaho, near Blaine, Idaho, north of Genesee, between 4.50 a.m. and 5.30 a.m., 5.26 a.m. to be precise. The phone utilizes cell resources that are consistent with the 8458 phone traveling south on ID State Road 95 to Genesee, Idaho, and then traveling west towards Uniontown, I Idaho, and then north back into Pullman, Washington. Hmm. 
At approximately 5.30 a.m., the phone is utilizing resources that provide coverage to Pullman, Washington, and consistent with the phone traveling back to the Coburger residence. The phone's movements are consistent with the movements of the wide Elantra that is observed traveling north to Stadium Drive at approximately 5.27 a.m. Based on a review of the phone's estimated locations and travel, the phone's travel is consistent with that of the white Elantra. I mean, y'all, I mean, literally just following this boy from doorstep to doorstep. Now, what interests me about the cell phone and it being turned off and what the officer here, the detective wrote about, you know, this is how this can, why this happens. For someone that seemingly has left all these breadcrumbs right back, he turns the phone off. So to me, if we're going in this logic that we're reading, it's like he was going, he was planning to do something. He didn't want to be traced, but yet he's all over video. So to me, this is so confusing in this as to why some things he tried to cover up, but other things it was like he was so sloppy or careless about them. You know, and again, I'm not some profile or any of that kind of stuff. Up, but this is what fascinates me about what makes monsters like this tick, right? Because I'm like, why are you so careful here, but not over here? So let's keep reading. Further review indicated that the phone utilized cell, cell resources on November 13th, 2022 that are consistent with the 8458 phone leaving the area of Coburger residence at approximately 9 a.m., traveling to Moscow ID... I'm sorry, Moscow, Idaho. I got all serious and then messed it up. Moscow, Idaho. Specifically, the phone utilized cell resources that would provide coverage to the King Road residents between 9, 12 a.m. and 9, 21 a.m. Y'all, it's he went back. He went back to the scene. I mean, these are just such classic cases of, you know, people who end up doing this, going back to the scene, doing all this stuff, right? The... 8458 phone next utilize cellular resources that are consistent with the 8458 phone traveling back to the area of the Coburger residence and arriving to the area at approximately 932. Uh, below is a depiction not to scale of the possible route taken based off the cell site locations. Now again, let's pause real quick. One thing I'm very curious, you know, they're looking for this weapon and doing this kind of stuff. I, you know they have to be combing this area, right? And it makes you wonder when he went back, did he did he go back into the residence? You know, what did he try and do? You know, and now again, we already know the roommates, you know, they survived, right? They started trying to get up with everybody and finding stuff. This makes more sense now that we hear from one roommate that had a brush in with them and that they couldn't get a hold of anybody. All this funny stuff was going on. And so it's like, let's start making some phone calls because something's not right. Well, imagine if he went back. Imagine, again, if he tried to go back to finish everybody off. I mean, you just never know with these kind of people. So let's finish this up. Investigators found the 8458 phone did connect to a cell phone tower that provides service to Moscow on November 14th, 2022, but investigators do not believe the phone was in Moscow on that date. The 8458 phone has not been connected to any towers that provide service to Moscow since that date. Very interesting also, right? Because as we'll see here in a minute, he's been casing this place for a while, right? But then all of a sudden, bam, nothing. You know, okay, listen, we're not going there anymore. Um, or at least not with that phone, right? Uh, based on my training experience and the facts of the investigation thus far, I believe that Koberger, the user of the phone, was likely the driver of the white Elantra that is observed departing Pullman, Washington, and that this vehicle is likely, likely suspect vehicle one. Additionally, the route of the travel of travel of the phone during the early morning hours of November 13th, 2022, and the lack of the phone reporting to AT&T between 2.47 a.m. and 8 a.m. 4:48 a.m. is consistent with Koberger attempting to conceal his location during the quadruple homicide that occurred at the King Road residence. On December 23rd, 2022, I was granted a search warrant for the historical CSLI from June 23rd, 2022, this is important, to current prospective location information and a pen register slash trap and trace on 8458 phone to aid in efforts to determine if Koberger stalked any of the victims in this case prior to the offense, conducted surveillance on the King Road residence, was in contact with the victim's associates before 
before or after the alleged offense and any locations any of that stuff so next paragraph december 23rd 2022 pursuant to the search warrant he got the information uh, let's see. After consulting with the uh, C and the cast SA, I was able to determine estimated locations for the 8458 phone from June 2022 to present. Okay, the time period authorized by the court. The records for the phone show the 8458 phone utilizing cellular resources that provide coverage to the area of 1122 King Road on at least 12 occasions prior to November 13th, 2022. All of these occasions, except for one, occurred in the late evening and early morning hours of their respective days. Oh my goodness. This is the part that absolutely just is bone chilling. So this dude, 12 other occasions, late at late night early morning hours again what took place on this night what made him go over the edge had he maybe been encountered them at the bar earlier and been brushed off by one of them like that's what in my mind like what is the motive of this right okay let's keep going one of these occasions on August 21st, 2022, 8458 phone utilized cell resources providing coverage to the King residence, King Road residence from approximately 10.34 p.m. to 11.35 p.m. Uh, at approximately 11.37, Coburger was stopped by Lotta County Sheriff's Department, uh, Corporal Duke, as mentioned above. The 8548 phone was utilizing cell resources consistent with the location of the traffic stop during this time. Further analysis of the cell data provided showed that the phone utilized cell resources on November 13th, consistent with the phone traveling from Pullman, Washington to Lewiston, Idaho via US Highway 195. At approximately 12.36 p.m., the phone utilized cell resources that would provide coverage to Kate's Cup of Coffee stand located at 810 Port Drive, Clarkston, Washington. Surveillance footage from the US from the U.S. Chef's store located at 820 Port Drive, Clarkston, Washington, and adjacent to Kate's Cup of Joe, showed a white Elantra, consistent with suspect vehicle one, drive past Kate's Cup of Joe, at a time consistent with the cell data from the phone. At approximately 12.46 p.m., the phone then utilized cell data in the area of the Albertsons grocery store at 400 Bridge Street in Clarkston, Washington. Surveillance footage obtained from the Albertsons showed Koberger exit the white Elantra, consistent with suspect vehicle 1, at approximately 12.49 p.m. Interior surveillance cameras show Koberger walk through the store, purchase unknown items at the checkout, and leave at approximately 1.04 p.m. Koberg's possible path of travel is depicted below. The photograph is not to scale, it says. Additional analysis of records for the 8458 phone indicate that between approximately 5.32 p.m. and 5.36 p.m., the phone utilized resources that provide coverage to Johnson, Idaho. The phone then stops reporting to the network from approximately 5.36 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. This is consistent with the phone being the area that the phone traveled in the hours immediately following the suspected time the homicides occurred on december 27th 2022 pennsylvania agents discovered the trash from the coburger family residence located in albrightsville pennsylvania that evidence was sent to the idaho state lab for testing and on the 28th 2022 the idaho state lab reported that a dna profile obtained from the trash and the dna profile obtained from the sheath identified a male as not being excluded as the biological father of the suspect profile. At least 99.9998% of the male population would be expected to be excluded from the possibility of being the suspect's biological father. Wow. Based on the above information, I'm requesting an arrest warrant issued for Brian C. Koberger, date of birth 11-21-1994, for the burglary at 1122 King Street in Moscow, Idaho, and four counts of murder, and the first degree of Madison, Kaylee, Zena, and Ethan. Whoa. So... I mean, major. We've been waiting for this probable cause to come out. You know, so much was like, let's see, what do they got on this guy? What do they got? Again, my hat goes off to the cops. They've been sitting here and just, you know, as we always see with a lot of these cases, they're not going to 
put out everything they know in the beginning. They can't, right? Imagine if they had tipped this dude off. I mean, what if he had taken his own life or god forbid taking the lives of others you know or flipped out and taking his dad out. i mean you never know right i mean look at what he's capable of so my hat goes off to them in the face of all the criticism that they you know received for this that this is going on the whole time they're literally just tracing this guy's steps i mean he's leading them right to him and again these are the big questions that i have is motive 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 what does this mean what does this say this seems very messy it just seems very all over the place it seems very un organized but a failed attempt to be organized like i said earlier why bother turning your phone off for one part but over here you're just you know it's as if he doesn't even know the video cameras exist right and again i we usually say i'm shocked you didn't go to walmart okay that's usually where they get caught up is walmart you know shocked it wasn't walmart we've got the grocery store but nonetheless you know it's not walmart so back so a couple of things you know back let's rewind a little bit so many people have been talking about the roommate and all this here's my things with this um we just we don't know right it's like yeah it does seem weird something clearly was going on she opened the door three times and at one point he seemingly walked right past her you know so again why did he let her live that whole nine yards why didn't she call him one till later in the day why not this why not that you know i'm so these are some of my questions maybe she didn't have her phone on her and it was like in some other part of the house and she was scared to death to walk out frozen in fear that kind of a thing of what do i do what do i do what do i do i'm going to wait till the sun comes comes up or whatever the case may be um you know who knows these were young kids who were out partying and drinking i mean you never know they could have been inside you know passed out at a certain point i mean th there's so many questions that i have about that but i do think that i mean with what the person said you know they were frozen in fear i mean something clearly was going on in the house this dude sweeps by now I also I, you know, I'm just trying to even put myself there. So yeah, the house is pretty this party house. You know, we we've seen the videos. We know they do that. So it's not out of the norm for people to be coming and going. But this seems still out of the norm, right? Um, but you never know. You know, some people. I, if you you already know, if we were all young at one point people have nightmare stories about oh i had a roommate they had you know girls that come in left and right guys coming left and right whatever the case may be so none of us know what the norm was for this house at this point but this is going to be a, a big part that I, I want to learn more about and again to find out why you know why did he let these two live again thank god he did uh secondly why was he sloppy about some things not about other things where is the murder weapon i think it will be found on this little trip that he did to get back home or whatever and again why this house why these kids why these victims why has he been following them for this long and checking on the house and what went down this evening you know did he have an encounter with them out in town and something happened and it pushed him over the edge and he went back and it was like this is it's going down because it almost seems like that like something like he was gonna go do his norm and then something snapped something triggered and it was like now i'm gonna do it so let me have have try and cover my ways i'll turn the phone off that kind of thing i am dying to hear what you all have to say what you think what you know your theories are with all this new information we've had come out my heart again goes out to the victims it goes out to the families show love down in the comment section to all of them this is so horrible and to read this and it literally makes the hair on my arm stand up to know what they were going through the body strewn throughout i mean these the poor kids the poor parents i just i cannot imagine getting that phone call i cannot imagine my world shattering like that i just i can't imagine what that would be like so again my heart goes out to them anyways let me know what you think down in the comment section thank you for hanging out you're probably going to be watching this in the morning time because it's kind of late i'm going to put this up and again i usually don't do these big read throughs like this so if you're still here thank you i appreciate it and i will go there back around this over real soon and until then i'll see you soon